I bet you didn't see me there for a second. Camouflage uniforms are basically patterns that are scientifically and artistically designed to deceive your eye. It's a Jedi mind trick on your eyeballs that make them think there really is no danger in front of you. When military camouflage is done correctly, it's capable of making even the least stealthy of soldiers practically invisible to our perceptions. But today, we take this craft, nay, this art form, for granted. We act like camo has been around forever, when in fact it's still a relatively new battlefield development, for humans anyway. For centuries, troops wore bright red colors into the fight. British soldiers fought in bright red coats as recently as 1885. So how did we go from this to this? In this episode, I want to examine the world's earliest forms of military camouflage and track our understanding of its evolution all the way into the modern day. Then we'll look into the great beyond and see what kind of high-tech cloaking devices troops will use in the near future. It will allow you to hide from wavelengths that are visible to more than just your naked eye. If you can spot the camouflage like and subscribe button, go ahead and fire off around into it and let's move out, Spare Parts Army. So the earliest book ever written on the subject of camouflage dates to the year 1890 and it was written by a British zoologist named Sir Edward Poulton. And that makes perfect sense that someone studying animals be the first to think about these cloaking principles. Don't be deceived by the book's name, even though it sounds like a Blue's Clues coloring book, The Color of Animals was deeply researched and instrumental in helping to articulate our early understanding of basic camouflage techniques that would later be used by military forces around the world. But it wasn't called camouflage at the time because that term hadn't really been coined for popular use yet. Instead, Paulton called it protective coloration, which is a great way of thinking about this subject in the military because it's meant to protect the soldiers by way of colors that mimic your environment. The basic premise of his work was something that we take for granted today. Sir Paulton believed animals imitation of their environment was proof of natural selection and proof that camouflage was valuable for survival. We see it in the way zebra stripes break up their shape relative to the background, or even in the more elaborate color changing lizards that your best friend in grade school was allowed to have and you weren't. In the year 100, when your average Roman infantryman was wielding a sword at the enemy, there was rarely a need for hiding your location. In fact, for thousands of years, soldiers wanted to be clearly marked so that their buddy wouldn't accidentally take a hack at them. Don't worry about it, Kaiser, it's just a flesh wound. Many would think the advent of firearms in the 1600s is what spurred widespread use of camo, but the opposite is actually true. Engagements were still below 100 meters in early musket warfare, so there really was no need for blending in, practically speaking. The psychological effect of troops' uniforms, colors, was more important, tactically speaking. The same is true in the case for animals in nature. Paulton wrote about it, calling the phenomenon aposmatism. An example would be the black and yellow pattern on a wasp, which is specifically meant to be a warning to others. Sir Paulton said, quote, when an animal possesses an unpleasant attribute, it is often to its advantage to advertise the fact as publicly as possible, which serves as the signal of danger or inedibility and is known as warning colors. Well said, sir. So then who was the first human in history to evolve our practical use of protective colors? None other than another Brit. In the year 1800, a British officer named Colonel Hamilton Smith wanted to test out a theory about which colors would fool his best marksman. So Colonel Smith set up some targets, he painted them three different colors, so you had your red, your gray, and your green targets. Then Hamilton had his soldiers fire away. What he found was most interesting. The red targets were hit twice as often as gray, and green were hit an intermediate amount of times. After the tests, he ran up to his British military higher ups and he begged them to consider switching to green uniforms for the entire infantry. The higher ups did what they do best and they flat out ignored the brilliant request for 50 years before implementing it in 1848, when I'm guessing some new general said it was his idea. At this point, some marksmen in the British 95th Rifle Regiment began to wear a flat green color to conceal themselves, but it wasn't widespread by any means. It was called military khaki. The term khaki comes from the language Urdu, which means soil colored. The word has its roots in the Persian language. But at this point, there was still no real pattern to the uniform. No one had thought to do that yet. It was still solid colors. 
but at least it was better than bright red coats. Troops of the British Indian Army were simply ghetto rigging their uniforms by dyeing their white uniforms with tea and curry. The next step in the evolution of camouflage has to do with a famous military blunder. By 1914, in World War I, advancements in firearms like smokeless powder, meant that you could aim at the bad guys without firing a chimney's worth of smoke out of your gun with each shot, which would make it impossible to see anything close to you. It's also the first time soldiers had to deal with airplanes flying overhead, trying to spot their location to call in artillery on them. Average distance of engagements increased to 300 meters. In spite of all of this, the effectiveness of camouflage was still widely debated in the military community. I kid you not, military generals of the time were skeptical of camo. The mentality of officers back then was that the lower enlisted wouldn't want to hide from a good fight. Sir, I refuse to wear this camo on my uniform. What if the enemy fancies me a pansy for trying to hide? No thank you. I'll take that jacket with the target painted on the back. I'm no When Henry Bertio, the Minister of War in France in 1911, campaigned and devoted his life to changing the French uniform away from the bright blue jacket and red pants, the French government had a full-on temper tantrum at the thought, saying, quote, to close the French soldier in some muddy, inglorious color, to banish all that is colorful, all that gives the soldier his vivid aspect, is to go contrary both to French taste and military function. Former war minister Etienne spoke for France, saying, eliminate the red trouser, never. Le pantheon rogue cesse la France. Seriously. <laughs> Don't I sound smart just sitting here with the benefit of historical hindsight, knowing that they were flat out wrong? This is proof that sometimes compromise isn't the right answer. Sometimes one side is just plainly wrong. So in 1914, at the Battle of the Frontiers, is when they got their horrible wake-up call. At the onset of World War I, 27,000 French soldiers were KIA. Some of those tragic losses can be attributed to not allocating resources to fixing their bright red uniform pants. But they didn't dwell on it. The French army became pioneers in this new field of protective colors, or as the French would call it, camouflage. The fancy pants French slang word camouflage became commonly used in the English language by 1915. It comes from their word camoufleur, which means to veil or disguise. Ha ha ha. Lucien Victor Guillard de Cerc oh, I can't say that, was known for painting some of the first irregular patterns onto tanks and artillery pieces. The French army started their first unit of camoufleurs in 1915, made up of professional artists. Finally, the theater kids and hipsters also had a place where they would be accepted into war. We had the Cubist painter André Mary, who got wounded by the enemy while he was in the middle of creating a false decoy observation tree. All in all, 15 camoufleur troops or KIA from setting up decoy positions during the First World War. So who were the first regular infantry, your average infantryman, who was issued the type of camouflage pattern that we associate with the military today? Well, that was none other than my peoples, the Italians, in 1929. With their M1929 Tello Memento pattern, we finally had our first uniform printed patterns. The concept here is that the shapes and different tone colors would defeat the human eye's natural tracking systems. It was originally only meant to be used on the troops' tents to prevent airplanes from spotting them overhead, but then someone got the bright idea to print the pattern onto uniforms. I like to think it was an Italian cappy who came up with the idea, but my actual last name literally translates to tiny hat maker, so I doubt it. The large brown and green blotches were a huge step in the right direction, and it's influenced camo to this day. It was used by the Italian military in World War II, where its biggest impact was the influence that it had on their German allies, and even some Soviet units tried to copy it. The M1929 Telememento pattern was only discontinued in the early 1990s. That's a full 60 years later. This makes it the longest continuous use of a camo pattern in the history of the world. It beats out most modern US patterns by an average of 59 years. For real, the US Army changes patterns more often than I change clothing. The pattern legacy lives on today, being considered a work of art in and of itself. In fact, sometimes I find myself staring deeply into the Telememento pattern, searching for some kind of deeper meaning, some sort of salvation perhaps. Does the camouflage pattern 
begin to look back at me, a, a kind of soldier's Rorschach test. Its iconic shapes pull you in. I feel myself beginning to vanish into the artwork of the camouflage. Anyway, after seeing that spicy camo, the Soviet Union, Germany, and my personal favorite, the United States, all developed pattern camos for World War II copying the Italian. The US Marine Corps had an interesting reason for ditching the pattern though and switching back to the khaki uniforms. Which brings us to our next evolutionary purpose of camouflage. It's not just meant to conceal, but to also recognize someone as friend or foe. This was extremely apparent in the 1980s when the British sold their former allies, the Iraqi army, a bunch of desert camouflage uniforms, and then they proceeded to have to fight them in the Gulf War 10 years later. The British army had to switch patterns to avoid confusion. Everyone made fun of the US Army's 2008 digital UCP, because it was a weird gray color that stood out. The universal camo pattern was this weird gray blue color, but it served the purpose of preventing insurgents from simply grabbing an easily acquired desert combat uniform from some army navy store, which was widely available, and then just walking onto a base somewhere. But where did all this digital camo come from? Who started the mass hysteria that developed into digital pattern madness that we're experiencing today? We can thank the Canadian military for that development. And honestly, when digital is done right, it's extremely effective. In the early 1990s, a Canadian camo program called Clothe the Soldier Project did more than simply sound like fashion week for the troops. The Canadian disruptive pattern came out of this research program. Digital print, CADPAT Woodland, was then adopted in 1997. The US Marines saw something that they liked and created their own version, which was just as awesome. Then the US Army saw the Marine version and created something called the UCP, an attempt to jump on the cool digital uniform train without fully understanding at first. The result was something that looked like an unholy insult to mother nature. One billion dollars later, and the army has now switched to using the OCP, which looks kind of like a, a mix of the old Woodland BDU and, and something more modern. It's much better than the UCP. But where will the future of camouflage take us? NATO's working on systems that will have to evade and deceive hyperspectral cameras. This means troops are no longer just hiding in one spectrum of light. They need their uniforms to conceal them in infrared spectrum as well. These new high-tech camouflage patterns work to conceal body heat from sensors and they even use fiber optics to change the fabric's color dynamically based on what your environment is. But will we ever see uniforms that can bend light waves so I can stop using cardboard boxes to blend in? Polaris Solutions made something called the JAG Hide, also known as Kit 300 Camouflage which is made of this thermal visual concealment. Don't worry though, there's already a military acronym for it, TVC. Never enough military acronyms. Can I get an unironic hua in the comment section? This isn't just some regular old fabric woven together, no thank you very much. It's made out of metals and fiber optics as well as different polymer plastics. It's still very lightweight and can be molded into different shapes so you can look like a rock sitting there. Or if you're like me and you have social anxiety, you can set one up in the corner of the party and you're good to go. The whole concept for this multi-spectral concealment alludes to the fact that it makes you invisible from more than just the naked eye's wavelengths. Good luck spotting me with your thermal vision. That new buzzword might replace camouflage one day. So we went from color protection to camo to multi-spectral concealment. Dr. Karen Stein, who works for the NATO Science and Technology Organization, said, quote, years ago, there were rapid developments of infrared sensors. So now we will have to change camouflage to make it possible to camouflage against thermal sensors. It's incredibly easy to see humans in thermal imaging miles away. Guy Kramer is the CEO of Hyperstealth Biotechnology Corporation, and he's known as one of the world's best camo experts out there, responsible for creating many of the camo patterns that soldiers use today. According to him, future camouflage will be similar to nature's chameleons. Military camo continues to look to nature for inspiration. So uniforms will change color, shape, and brightness in real time as it senses your environment. If that sounds absurd to you, I point you in the direction of those t-shirts that start to use any lights and LEDs on them. You know, like the ones you see at Burning Man. Guy Kramer calls this new fabric that they're engineering smart camo. Duck and take cover from the incoming smartphone analogies. This tech will change color through the process of electromagnetic fibers that run through the cloth. But for one of the same reasons that the French army balked at changing away from the red pants, modern armies are also unable to switch to this uniform because it's so cost prohibitive for the prototype. Each uniform is about a thousand bucks. 
Mr. Kramer thinks we'll be more likely to see this tech on tanks and jet airplanes first before your average everyday regular line infantryman will be wearing it. The future of camouflage will ultimately reach its pinnacle when we've created a technology that can bend light to make the wearer invisible. Guy Kramer is working on quantum stealth to do just that. When are we gonna stop slapping the word quantum in front of everything? I'm joking, I could never develop a new tech, that's why I make these videos in my dad's basement. We've come a long way from the bright red coats and pants to the solid color, dull khaki uniforms of the 1940s to our modern digital pixel design camouflage. There's still huge amount of room for improvements and technologies that are fast maturing to make camo of the future unrecognizable. Thank you for watching. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. You're watching Task and Purpose. Remember, we have a new episode coming out every Tuesday and Thursday at 12 p.m. from now on, so be sure to tune in then and get it while it's hot.